Good morning. Welcome back to our Saturday seminars. My name is Caitlin and I'm one of the captains of this beautiful schooner Adventurous. So today we're going to do a virtual tour of the ship so you get a chance to see what happens when the ship is hauled out of the water. The reason we're hauled out is twofold. One, we have our regular Coast Guard inspection and the others to do the routine maintenance that happens in the winter. So for the Coast Guard hull inspection, they're doing normal checkups. It's like a regular doctor visit. They want to make sure all the ships that they have certified are in fact seaworthy to carry passengers. And our inspection went well. Uh, the, the lead inspector actually left saying there was not much to see here. And that's really because the ship has been almost entirely restored over the last decade in the Centennial Restoration Project. So most of the wood is actually not over 100 years old. She's in good shape and we'll look at how you can tell. And another thing that Coast Guard is looking for is the quality of the through hulls. So we're going to take a tour and look at some of those things and also the normal projects. Uh, so let's come closer. <laughs> So for inspecting the hull, the, uh, the Coast Guard a little bit down, <laughs> um, uses a, a small hammer, a little smaller than this guy, this is the smallest one I have, uh, and you tap on the wood and listen for the sound. And I'm not going to do it here on the new paint, but you get used to what it sounds like. If it's nice and hard, it's like knocking on the watermelons in the store. Uh, they get used to the sound, what is good, strong, solid wood, and what does it sound like if it's uh, not as solid anymore. So we can whack the rudder. It hasn't been painted yet when we get there. Another thing are the through hulls. So if we look up, great, here's one, here's another one there. Yep. Um, these are, uh, two of them are intakes and one's actually a drain, but these are places where water comes in the hull to cool the machinery. And the way the Coast Guard inspects them is that one person usually is on the inside with a flashlight and one person is on the outside. And as you close the valve, you should make sure no light comes around. Um, and we'll see this one from the inside. You'll see the blue of the tarp down below. So these we make sure are in good condition. And let's walk farther out. Here's another fun thing you don't get to see much. So this is our speedometer. Yep, there it is. Um, and there's a tiny little wheel in here. This guy spins and tells us how fast we're going through the water. So that goes into a transducer. So here, um, there's a lot of stuff going on. We have some unpainted wood, so I'm okay to whack it. You won't hear very much, but the point is just... Get a, get a feel for the sound. It's, uh, it's all solid, it's fine. <laughs> um, something else happening back here. We are fine tuning our cathodic protection system. So when you have metals underwater, they're naturally gonna corrode. Um, and we know that, but we, we want them the way that we made them. <laughs> so what we do is we put a less noble metal um, to corrode in its place. So here uh, we have a teardrop anode. I'm saying anode, not zinc. We, we say zinc kind of colloquially because um, they often are, but this is actually an aluminum-based anode which we're uh, going to replace. So often they're welded onto the hull because that's simple when the ship is hauled out. So like this one was here, welded onto the rudder. Uh, well, we're, we're not going to do that because it's hard to adjust them that way. So instead, this is one of one of the anodes we took off the hull. Um, this is designed to be attached with bolts. So the bolt comes through here. So what we're gonna do with these holes, it's actually weld on studs um, so that a diver in the water can easily change the size of the anode if this one is not the right amount of uh, material. So that's something that we'll be fine tuning. Uh, <laughs> but, but in terms of being out of the water, the, pro the plan is to weld on the studs so that they will be adjustable and we can make sure we get, get the proper amount of protection on each of the metals that are isolated from each other underwater. So let's come around to the other side and we'll actually get a, get a look at the ship. I'll stand here for scale. Come 
I got the heat. So one of the other main projects that's happening is we're painting the hall. So you can see this part has been painted. This has yet to be painted. Um, we're using a an anti-fouling paint that is ablative. Um, and what that means is, well, first paint is made up of a few things. So you have the resin, which is the, the binder, the actual sticky stuff that does the job you want it to do. Usually um, that is carried in a solvent and the solvent will disappear as the paint dries, leaving uh, the resins, the sticky things to connect to each other and make that film. It often has um, additives. So in our case, copper is important because that's one of the only ways, really the only practical way for us to keep wood boring worms out of a wooden ship. So the state of Washington was trying to get rid of copper and bottom paints because it's bad for the environment. And that's very true. However, right now we don't have another practical way to protect the ship from Torito or boring worms that, that even in the relatively cool waters in Puget Sound are still present. Uh, so we do have copper in our bottom paint and it's ablative paint, meaning as the outside layer is oxidized in the water, it sloughs off, falls away, and it leaves um, the deeper layers that are still active to, to protect uh, the ship over time. So every two years, we want to repaint the bottom to make sure we have uh, a good solid layer to keep the worms out of the ship we just rebuilt. So I realize I'm not stopping for questions because we're doing a bit of a tour and it's hard for me to see in the sun. Let me see what anyone has to say. You don't see any questions yet. Okay, we're gonna go um, on deck and then below. So you'll have a moment to think about what you should ask. We'll be back. All right. So here on deck, I want to point out um, where our deck boxes used to be. So a lot of um, things from the ship have been taken by volunteers in our Adopt-A-Box program. So a lot of work that's happening this winter is not happening on the ship. People have taken boxes home, adopted them for the winter uh, to be refinished and taken care of, especially um, right now with COVID, we can't do a lot of that <laughs> here on, on the vessel. So let's see. Is there any questions yet? Okay, is there any place doing research into safer treatments than copper? I hope so. Um, I don't know, that's a good question. I imagine because there's an environmental reason for it that there is a push uh, to figure something out. In the past, people use uh, lead plates as an option or copper plates, and right now we have the copper in the paint. Um, but in terms of what is happening now, I don't know, we could see if anyone in the audience knows, go ahead and write in. I'd be curious to find out as well. Okay, so let's come. So I'll watch your step down below. A lot of the sole boards are up. There's not so much to stand on. I'll go down a little more. And uh, yes, we, we brought all the paint inside so it wouldn't freeze and be useless to us. Um, and also, when we are a little concerned about freezing, we did drain the freshwater piping just to make sure we didn't have any trouble with that if it got too cold. Okay. So here we are in the main cabin. Hope no one's getting seasick. Um, and let's just uh, point. I'm gonna talk a moment. Okay, so uh, one of the things about maintenance on a ship is it's always opportunistic. So just like you do at sea where there are different categories of projects you do in different latitudes. So in the tropics, you do a lot of coatings, um, things that need good weather to be done. And as you go farther, for example, south and the weather gets worse, you do kind of more steel work, rig projects, things that can handle some uh, rain as you're doing them. And then when you get into really high latitudes, the maintenance stops and you just take care of the ship and try to stay warm. 
Um, but in terms of being opportunistic, we're trying to do things that you can only do when you're out of the water because we have to prioritize our, our time and resources uh, this year, especially. So we have an opportunity to dry the inside of the ship and wooden boats almost always have some water in the bilge and that's fine. Um, but because we're now out of the water, we're trying to dry some of those centerline timbers enough to, to get a coat of oil on. So we'll look at that up forward. And another thing that happens normally um, is we're going to replace the stuffing box. So this is gonna be a little hard to see, but down here, a chunk. Um, great, so yeah, that's a good angle. So here is the propeller shaft and this is where it goes out of the hull. Um, so this contraption is called the stuffing box. Um, and it's, it's an interesting goal because here, obviously, the propeller shaft needs to be able to spin, but we don't want any water coming in while that happens. So the way this works is this is in two pieces. And this one can slide apart. And inside, there is shaft packing. So I have some new packing here. So um, this is uh, actually a plant material. So this is flax and tallow. So uh, um, actually a natural grease. So what, what we're gonna do is uh, we'll pull the old packing out and then you wrap a bunch of wraps of the packing, the new packing on the propeller shaft. You want to make sure to get the rings the right size. And this, I believe, we have a record says it will take six of these rings. I can reach it anyway. Uh, they can't end up in a spiral. So what's going to, because they need to sit flat. So what will happen is we'll get them all here on the propeller shaft and then cut them at a diagonal, actually. You can see my hand. Woo. Okay, so we'll cut them at a diagonal. Um, and that's because we need just a little extra for it to expand. So again, I'm not going to do all of these projects now. It's kind of a show and tell. Um, and then we'll have the rings that will be just the slightest bit bigger than their diagonal size. And after you've removed the old packing, then you um, carefully insert these one at a time. So that all of this packing will end up in here. And then it will be tensioned by closing this collar, uh, pushing down on them again. Okay. Are there any questions about <laughs> no questions. So it's uh, it's common for this packing to be replaced every so often. Um, and right now what's in here is actually a, a grinding. And we're going back to this um, flex. Uh, the graphite is a little more structurally sound. It was um, chosen when we were having a little trouble with the shaft being in alignment. But now that uh, is believed to be sorted out. And also uh, the graphite is a conductor of electricity and it is not supposed to pass electricity from the propeller shaft to the stuffing box. However, we are finding that in reality, it was a little bit um, and we don't want that. So with our aligned propeller shaft, we should be good uh, with the flax packing again. Okay. Um, another project that's going to happen is we're going to be integrity of our bearings. So as a way to keep track of them and how they are wearing or not, um, you can measure kind of how much <laughs> slop they've got in them. So let's look at this bearing. There it is. Oh, there it is not. There it is. <laughs> okay, so something you can do uh, to tell... The, I'm going to take it for a moment here. Okay. Let's see if this is going to work. Yeah. So one of the ways you can tell the health of the bearing is to see how much the propeller shaft is capable of moving. So what you can do is take a, a hydraulic jack and just 
push up on the propeller shaft and see how much it will move. It's a very small amount, like thousands of inches, um, but you take what's called um, a depth gauge, which is like a little needle on a gauge <laughs> with a spring. I don't have one. Uh, one is coming to us Tuesday to measure. So the kind of needle on the spring, as you push the propeller shaft, just the tiniest bit, the needle goes in and you can read how much the propeller shaft is able to move. So we'll um, keep track of all of our bearings that way as a way to tell how healthy they are. Um, they looked very good last haul out. So we're doing this as, again, routine maintenance. This is a routine maintenance year. Okay, are there questions about that? Not so much. Okay, let's uh, go forward. A lot of fans in here for uh, air circulation. So before we go too far, let's take a look at our... Uh, our documents. So here we always have posted, um, like all ships, our documents. And I thought it would be interesting to take a look. So here on our COI, um, again, we'll get a new one of these from the Coast Guard. So we just did our another um, inspection. So uh, different kinds of exams and when they are due. So our dry docking, when that is due, uh, the wood hull fastener. So next haul out in 2023. Um, we actually will pull out some of the fasteners holding the ship together and make sure that they're in good shape to see what they look like. Um, and then internal uh, structure exam. So we'll get another another certificate from the Coast Guard since we have passed our, our, our uh, doctor's appointment for this year. Okay. So... Um, there are a few things that you can do in the water, but are, are preferable to do when you're out of the water because they're a little drier. Um, and one is cleaning sea strainers. I have it. So when, when uh, salt water comes from the ocean into, for example, the engine to cool it down as it's designed, you want to make sure that the water isn't full of, you know, seaweed and jellyfish and all kinds of things, ice even. Uh, that would clog <laughs> clog the system and mean the engine can't cool itself down. So you have a sea strainer, and this one is uh, gooky, uh, but we'll clean it up, up like this so that you can actually see through it. It's nice to be able to see what's going on in there. So here's a bucket, essentially. And inside goes a little basket. So um, this will be inside of the... Um, plexiglass container here and and strain whatever might be <laughs> in the water coming coming through. It's pretty important um, for your engine cooling system. I've definitely had a few events where I found that there's no cooling water coming out of the engine and it was the sea strainer was clogged and we have of course had to stop the engine so it didn't overheat and deal with that uh, as soon as possible. So um, that's one project. All of them uh, actually have been done except for this one I just showed you. Um, and another thing, we'll put this generator through hull back together. So this one I left so you could see it. It's the only straight one um, that you can actually see out of. So, if you see there's a little bit of blue, then uh, you won't see anything coming out anymore. So again, this is one of the things the Coast Guard was looking at, making sure that no light was coming through the, the valve. Now if I open it, you can see the tarp again. Woo. So, yeah, enough. Um, this one is also easy because it's small, but if you are working with bigger hoses, the ones that I already put back, uh, the way to make them 
malleable enough is to is with heat. And I I like to use hot water, so I'll usually make a make a pot of tea and pour half the water in a tub, and then you can uh, put the end of the hose in the tub of hot water, and it becomes soft enough to move. Um, that's not the right one. I always like to use hex drives on the hose clamps instead of a screwdriver. It's a lot easier. It's almost always a, a 5 16 or a 7 mil. So if you go looking for one, you're looking for the orange handle. Um, there should always be two hose clamps for these important things. So this is, you know, potentially sink the boat plumbing. That's why the Coast Guard is in particular um, concerned about these. So of course the hose has to be uh, regulation strength and size. <laughs> these are just big enough for this so they don't want to open up enough to go down. I'm going to end. Here we go. So we'll put these facing two different directions because the, the tightest part always ends up being right under the screw. And one should go right at the very bottom of the hose and the next one goes just right on top of it. And then we'll make sure this is closed because when we go back in the water, you, you want to be present in all of the places where the water comes back in the ship. So all of the through holes will be closed and then we'll go around and personally open them one by one and just make sure that they are secure. Uh, nothing is leaking uh, before they let us go out of the slings. More questions coming in? Make sense? All right, let's go forward to, oh, here's a question. Um, okay, response from Catherine says, in recent years, we've used Ultima Eco Bottom Paint thanks to a generous donation from Pettit Paint. Yeah, so the Ultima Eco Paint is to keep things from growing on the hull, on the outside, like to keep barnacles off. Um, and there should still be a barrier for the, for the Torito worms underneath the, the Eco Paint on the outside. Okay, let's go to the folks. Old. So you can see here we have the black water tank was open. We moved it to get to some things behind it and then a little farther forward. Um, this is what we're most interested in, in doing a little farther aft, but it's not quite dry enough yet. So um, this is a dry bilge, the forecastle bilge, uh, but we still want to make sure that we're uh, taking care of the timbers here. Some of these center line timbers that if water were to get in, we want to make sure we have some protection on those. So now you can see down. I don't, I don't think you can see that. Yeah, great. So we'll do a couple coats of this on, on all these center line timbers. And it's just to keep water out of the wood and protect it. Give it a little more life. Again, this is one of those things that it's good to try to stay ahead on. If we've sailed together, you'll hear me say that the the forces of entropy on a ship are very strong and every day that we don't work against them, they gain on us. So this is one of the ways we're trying to stay ahead of all those forces of entropy. Just take care of everything as much as we can. Okay, so we'll do that on all of our, our centerline timbers. Make sure to take care of them. 
looks like we might have another question. What is the approximate cost uh, daily to be out of the water? Uh, a little over $100 a day for us right here. Um, and what type of oil is this? This is a mixture of boiled linseed oil and turpentine. Uh, so the turpentine just makes it thin. So thin linseed oil. So it will soak into the wood. Um, it's a pretty common thing on ships. Raw linseed oil is thinner. It's a little more volatile, um, dangerous in that if it gets too hot, it will spontaneously combust. So that's something to be careful with. On ships, we are using mostly boiled linseed oil, which is not as likely to do that. It's more, more condensed, having been boiled. Um, <laughs> and it is darker. But we're just thinning it out with turpentine, so it will soak right up into the wood. Okay. And let's go back out on deck. Uh, something else to show back uh, here. Um, here's an interesting thing. It's visible now. So again, without adopt a box program, a lot of the wood has been taken home and adopted. So the cover over the steering gear is away and it's actually a nice time to see this, so as long as no one's standing under it, you can see how this turns. So I have a lot of mechanical advantage here. And uh, Once when I was a student on this ship uh, in the early 2000s, one anchor watch uh, with a physics major, we figured out the mechanical advantage of the helm. So you have the lever of the side of the helm. You also have the, uh, the screw right, the incline playing here. And this is also another small lever in this arm after the car. So uh, <laughs> it's a very memorable night for me as a high school student. And I still think it's um, impressive because you need to magnify uh, the force quite a bit to be able to turn a ship this size. It's a lot of water pressure moving on the rudder when the ship is going fast. So. Here we go. That is a, it's called a, a worm gear with those two opposite cars. Is anyone? Okay. Got some more questions. How many boxes are there to adopt? A few more, if you'd like one. <laughs> I don't have a number in my head, but there are still a few uh, bright things I imagine that could, could find a home. Okay. Um, another thing is right under you can back up. So in the winter, when we are not using some parts of the rig, the only time you can take care of some things, for example, like the belaying pins. So these are just soaking in more boiled linseed oil. Um, they're out on deck all summer being used. Um, and these, like the pin rails, are a hard thing to take care of because you're always using them. So it's, it's difficult to find a time you can take care of these things. So these um, are just soaking. We'll turn them upside down every so often, and then they should be in good condition to go for the rest of the, the sailing season after we're done. So again, we're being opportunistic, trying to find the best things to do that we can only do right now um, when we have access to them or when it's possible to use some of these things. So are there any more questions? All right, well, let's go back and take one more look at the ship so you can see her beautiful hull shape out of the water. Thank <laughs> you. 
about this design is the way the bow and the stern under the water they both come in so you can see that a little bit here and we'll walk forward and you'll see it some again um, that does a few things one it allows us to spin um, a lot in a smaller circle than we would if the hole was wide on both ends but you can see back here how much yeah how much the stern comes in so even the rudder is angled forward quite a lot and then coming forward, we have the bow is very cut away. And as we're walking, I'll point out we have a, a seal ballast keel. So in 1913, um, the, there was a steel keel, which is the same one we have now. It's one of the only original pieces still left on the ship. There are some, but that is one of them. Um, and then the wood comes down on top of it. So all of this is wood, and then this is steel, and we're called, we call it the ballast keel. Um, it helps us stay stiff, and it also adds weight. Just so you can see the shape of the ship, you can see that the bow is very cut away. It's so a crown and shield design, um, and she just sails beautifully. And let's keep coming forward. Yeah, yeah, right there, it's good. <laughs> okay. Dun, 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 dun. There she is, beautiful. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and for all of your interest in supporting and participating in this ship. And someday, coming up soon, we'll have you sailing on this beautiful hull. It's like a couple questions I'll look at. Um, can you show us where the garboard strake is? And also, can you tell us cool things about the propeller? Sure. Okay, let's look at the garboard strake. It's this way. Okay, so the, the garboard, uh, well, let's back up. So a, a strake, um, right, is a, is a fore and aft um, timber. And the garboard one is the one right above the keel. And I suspect you're asking, this comes up a lot in, uh, in exams and questions I ask about the garboard strike. It's, in a, it's a tricky one to keep tight, keep water tight because of the way the ship is working. Um, and our, so we have, this is the ballast keel. And then we have this kind of counts as keel because it's still flat. And then as the ship starts to make the V shape, um, then you have this piece is the garboard strake. So you can see it uh, kind of coming along. And so you're looking in the light there a bit, but it's it's the bottom one. And then cool things about the propeller. Sure, let's look at the propeller. Okay, so here's our uh, three blade 44 inch propeller. Um, it is made out of silicon bronze. So uh, that is a, a malleable um, alloy. Uh, we want it to be something you can shape uh, to make this intricate, beautiful shape. So it's a silicon bronze uh, for that reason. And my favorite thing about a propeller is the shape of the blades. So, um, excuse me. <laughs> you imagine as this spins, um, it's spinning, say, down this way. Um, it's hitting the water at a different angle, at a different point away from the propeller. Oh, I should do that on the side close to me. So, right here. I can't tell if you can see this very well. 
I suppose you can. I'll just act, activate it kind of with my hand. So the angle of the propeller close to the propeller shaft is like this. But as you, um, so it's, let's say looking from going straight up and down, the propeller has a kind of a large angle with the water. And then here's straight up and down. And then up here, the propeller has a smaller angle with the water as it spins this way. And then even farther up, the propeller has even a smaller angle with the water. I'm gonna ask you, why might that be? Give you a moment to think about it. So the angle is big. It's a big angle to the water when it's close to the propeller shaft. And the angle is small to the water when it's far away from the shaft. And think about how the propeller is spinning. How fast is the middle of the propeller spinning? And then how fast is the outside of the propeller spinning? So in close to the propeller shaft, as it turns around, the inside is not spinning as fast as the outside is spinning because the outside has to make a big circle in the same amount of time because they're rigidly connected. Whereas the inside is going slower because it only has a small circle to trace in the same amount of time. So what we're doing with this swept blade is making sure that as the propeller spins, every part of it is, cre is creating the same force, really. So as the outside, which is spinning fast, it doesn't need to push on the water with as big of an angle because it's spinning fast, but the inside that's spinning slow needs to push on the water with a bigger angle. And that way the force is even and if you get a, you get a nice strong push of water flow back. Here we have some comments coming in. Ends of blades move faster than center. Yes, exactly. And then another question for stability um, in a way that it, it balances it balances the push that way and it maximizes the force. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's a cool thing about a propeller. <laughs> um, if you're ever here in the boat yard, it's really fascinating, very educational to just walk around and look at all the boats under the water and see the other propellers. I can't show you because I didn't ask for any permission, um, but there's some interesting examples on each side of us. <laughs> if you're in Port Townsend, just come walk around and take a look. Okay, any other questions? Well, all right. I hope everyone enjoyed a, a virtual tour of the ship and getting to see what's happening while we're hauled out of the water. Um, this is the normal stuff that happens every two years. And again, we we're in a good, a good place with uh, the Coast Guard and within our own organization for sailing next season. So hope everyone is doing well. And we'll see you at the next Saturday seminar. Bye.